This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. He has written books with some of the biggest names in sports. Best-selling author and former Sports Illustrated Associate Editor, Don Yeager, on this edition of Conversations. Don Yeager has had the rare opportunity to work with some of the biggest personalities in sports, from Walter Payton to the legendary UCLA coach John Wooden. Yeager has been privileged to go inside the world of champions. His reputation as a writer is twofold. One, he's a storyteller with an ability to put on paper what's inside the heart of some of the greatest figures in sports. The other, as a hardcore investigative journalist exposing the darker sides of America's sports culture. He has written 17 books, four landing on the New York Times bestseller list, not to mention numerous articles for such publications as Sports Illustrated and Success Magazine. These days, Yeager continues to write, but he spends a good bit of his time speaking to Fortune 500 companies and other organizations on what he calls the 16 consistent characteristics of greatness. Don Yeager, welcome to Conversations. Hey Jeff, thank you very much. Take me back, what began your career in journalism? Actually, um, ironically, my, my father uh, was transferred from Okinawa, Japan, where we lived, to uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. And when I showed up for high school, um, they asked me to sign up for a class. And I signed up for ROTC, which is what I thought, having grown up around the military all my whole life, that I would, I would enjoy. And uh, the night before school started, the, the uh, guidance counselor called and said there wasn't enough students in my school that wanted to be a part of ROTC. And, she had to put me in something else, so she put me in journalism, and uh, and um, turned out to be quite a fortuitous decision. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity to get to tell stories and write uh, ever since then. You started out primarily as a newspaper man, though. I right? did. Yeah, I started out as a newspaper guy. I started I worked in newspapers in San Antonio, Dallas, and Jacksonville, Florida, and then um, I had the opportunity to start writing books. And a few years after that, Sports Illustrated came and gave me an opportunity to be one of only 30 writers they have in the entire country, and it was uh, a pretty exciting and pretty amazing place to be for about 11 years. What was it like working for Sports Illustrated? It was a dream. You know, you sit and uh, first off, the, the camaraderie. The you know, a lot of uh, a lot of journalism organizations have. There's an awful lot of jealousy, backbiting. The thing I enjoyed most about Sports Illustrated was that that you were working with some of the most talented people in the entire world, and mm -hmm. and every one of them respected you for being there, and uh, and so it was just this. It was uh, I, some of the closest relationships I still have today in journalism are, are uh, friends I made while working at Sports Illustrated. Really great, really great opportunity. What was your favorite story that you covered while at Sports Illustrated? Probably a really tough story, but it was one that I would tell you, you know, in, in doing what we do and getting the chance to be part of uh, uh, journalism, you, you don't often think you get to make, to really make a difference. Right. Um, a few years ago I was working on a, uh, I was working on a book and, and a mother called me and she told me about um, her son, who the book was about youth sports in America, the AAU culture, the whole, um, you know, the pressure that a lot of the kids right. feel today. And this mother was telling me about this coach who had um, molested her child and how that there was no law in the state in which she lived that actually led to, that had background checks that really had required background checks for youth sports coaches. And uh, ended up doing a story. It took about eight months for Sports Illustrated. Went to prison, met with a number of inmates who uh, who had been convicted of molesting children that they got access to through youth sports. And um, and that story, which ended up on Oprah, mm -hmm. um, uh, ended up leading a number of states, including Florida, to uh, to begin um, requiring background checks of their youth coaches, uh, just as they do. Uh, child care workers, just as they do school bus drivers. Right. Now youth coaches have to go uh, uh, undergo a level of background checks as a result. So it was a tough story, one of those things that very emotionally, r r r you know, ripping. And mm -hmm. um, I will tell you, I still keep in touch with a number of those uh, young men and women that I yeah. interviewed um, who, for the first time in their lives, told someone outside of their family about what that experience um, had done to them. Wow. And, uh, and having gone through that with them, uh, we've developed a bond for life, and yeah. um, I, but the story, um, one of those rare opportunities where you could look back and say today, that that piece 
probably led to some changes. Yeah, yeah. Well, so many, so, so many journalists go into the business to make a difference, and yeah. that clearly is a case where that happened. Huh? Yeah, it is. I think this, it's true. A lot of, you know, especially my generation, we all came in kind of post-Watergate into wow. journalism thinking, you know what, we're going we're gonna to set the world on fire, we're going to change it. And, uh, but the truth is that, um, that often um, you don't really get a chance, and uh, you don't, you, at least you don't get to see the fruits of yeah. that labor. And uh, in this case, uh, I would tell you that uh, it's one of those things I'll, I'll hold on to for a long time. You said something as we were talking that, uh, about the pressure that young people feel this day and age to perform in sports. Do you think there's too much pressure on Oh, it? without question. It's, you know, when I'm um, talking to, to, to surgeons, doctors, coaches, um, about what's happened today in youth sports in America, the, you know how we've ratcheted things up. How everybody believes, every parent believes, their, uh, you know, they their uh, uh, their child is the next Greg Maddox or the next Peyton Manning, right. um, and uh, and so what they do um, uh, to their own child, both in the mental pressure they put on them to perform, um, and on top of that, the overperformance. Um, yeah. Too often, you know, I mean, you talk to some of these doctors who will tell you they're doing surgeons on children that are spending their entire summer throwing six, seven innings of baseball every day. You know, right. your, your body can't do that. That's not, right. uh, we're not built for that. And yeah. uh, especially a 12-year-old child is not built for that. Yeah. And um, a lot of these kids who probably have great talent are burned out of sports by the time they're 15. And um, we're ruining the experience for them. And yeah. I, I hope uh, now as I raise my son, um, who's two, that I, I, I'll be a little smarter at that. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Um, these guys that make it to the top, because you've worked with some of the great ones, the Walter Paytons and the Warwick Dunn's of the world. Um, those guys, it, it, are, they, are they born with that great talent or is that something that they're able to perfect over time? I, I would tell you, and this is an absolute, from every conversation I've ever had with a great winner, they would tell you no one is born great, no one. Um, greatness is about, as I love to say all the time in speeches, um, doing common things uncommonly well. Mm -hmm. The really great ones are have a level of dedication to what they're what they're out to achieve that most people can't replicate. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of us talk about being successful, talk about uh, getting up off the couch and going and doing something. Uh, the truly great ones um, just uh, just take it to that next level. They do what they what they say they will. Yeah. Discipline. Yeah, yeah, it's all about discipline. Yeah. Speaking of the great ones, tell me about your relationship with Walter Payton. You had a unique relationship with him. It was um, it was spectacular. He, uh, I had appeared on Oprah Winfrey's show. Walter had seen me on the show, and uh, and he actually reached out to me, um, called, and he was ready to do a book, and it was time for him to do a book. And interesting, you know, here was Walter Payton, uh, forty in his mid forties, forty five, forty six. And for all of his achievements, all of his accomplishments, he had never written a book. I mean, there are, you know, teenage, uh, you know, gymnasts today who are writing their life story, and I keep wondering, you don't have a life yet. How right, can, right. How can you write a life story? Right. And yet here was Walter Payton, who had not done one. And uh, the opportunity came for, uh, for me to fly to Chicago and, uh, and spend the next few weeks of his life with him. Um, they ended to be the last weeks of his life. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter was dying of cancer. He knew it, and it was the right time for him uh, to actually kind of tell his story. And I will tell you, um, the relationship I built with the family, uh, I still remain very close with his, uh, with his widow, Connie, his son, Jarrett, daughter, Brittany. We, we, um, in fact, Jarrett got married a year ago, and uh, they had the reception up in Soldier Field. It was an honor to be there. And um, just it's, it's great to get a chance to be around them because they, as a group, uh, they, his widow, his two children, continue to live um, many of the special things that Walter um, wanted everybody else to r realize was important to greatness. What was the most valuable lesson you took away from, from your experience with him? You know, Walter talked about doing things for people that couldn't repay you. He used to talk all the time about that true greatness, the true success in life is about finding opportunities um, to do little things for people that can never return the favor. You know, if, if all you do are things for people that are going to give you something back, those are nice, and that's right. really the, right. and and probably done with a genuine heart because you want something back. Sure, sure. But the truly greatest things done are for those who um, aren't uh, aren't capable of giving you anything in return. You know, Walter uh, told a story in the book that I thought was really valuable about 
um, the championship year that the Bears, where the Bears won the Super Bowl with Walter as their star player. Um, that year, uh, there was a young woman who was working at the front desk of the, uh, of the Bears training complex, and she was having a rough time in her life. There were some things going on at home that led her and her husband to separate. Her children were suffering as a result, and um, Walter Payton knew what this young woman was going through because he asked every day when he came through the training complex doors. He asked about her children. Greatest player on the team, asking mm -hmm. about her children. Mm -hmm. And uh, on five different occasions during that Super Bowl year, Walter Payton came to the front desk after the practice was over, tapped that young woman on the shoulder and told her to go home and spend the afternoon with her children. And he sat down and answered phone calls. You're kidding. Now, Walter Payton, greatest player on the team. Can you imagine calling in to complain about your season tickets on that day? <laughs> I mean, seriously, you know. And thank you for calling wow. the Chicago Bears. This is Walter Payton. What, you know, what more can I do for you? Wow. He just was, um, you know what, that young woman could never return the favor. There's nothing she could do for him. Right. And yet, on those occasions, he gave her the opportunity to do something exceptional with her children yeah. that um, you know, she'll never forget. What, what, what was he like in those last few weeks of his life? Because, I mean, he knew the end wasn't near. Was he at peace with it? Uh, I don't think anybody's ever really completely at peace. Walter, um, you know, he remained hopeful, even though he, he knew hope was really against him. I think he, the one thing about him was that he was extremely introspective. Mm -hmm. It was a completely unique experience, having written books with other athletes, people, um, in that when, you, when, when, you f when you're with someone in those last few weeks of their life like that, um, they're more open mm -hmm. to um, introspection. Right. They're more, they, 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 they're self, they're critical of themselves in a way that they wouldn't you know, sometimes be if they were, um, if they knew that this was going to go on forever. Uh, it was really, it was, there were times Walter told me things um, that he couldn't tell his daughter, for example. Right. She was a young teen. And he knew that she, he couldn't really say certain things to her about how proud he was because he would break down. Right. So he would tell me, knowing I would tell her. Right. And I became this strange kind of conduit within the family at times. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, Your latest book with Michael Orr, tell that story. Well, he is uh, what an amazing young man. I mean, America fell in love with his story through the blind side. Clearly, um, unbelievable young man. But what the blind side misses, the part... The movie kind of starts with his, you know, being saved by the family, you know, mm -hmm. being on the right side of the road when a, when a BMW pulls by. Um, what they miss is that Michael Orr is an amazing man who was 16 at that time. And if you, in the first 16 years of his life, I can't even imagine what it would have taken to have grown up in that environment and still have maintained a, a, a daily desire to get yourself out. I mean, mm -hmm. it would have been very easy for Michael Orr to have fallen into the trappings of, of his neighborhood and to have become one of them. And yet, uh, Michael wanted every day to find a way to be out of that environment. And he, um, the book is really about the life that led to the blind side. And he wrote the book largely to encourage the 500,000 kids in America who are in foster care, like mm -hmm. he was, to realize that they're, it's really not about being on the right side of the road or being 6'5 when, you know, a, fa a, a rich family drives by. It's not about luck. It's about hard work. And he did all the right things to yeah. be available to be saved. Yeah. And that's what most people miss in that story is that if he'd have done any one of the bad things that had been given to him as opportunities, he wouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't have been available to be walking on that street. Yeah. It's about character. It really is. And yeah. he is a man of, of enormous character. You know, it's funny, sometimes you work on these projects and you wonder, boy, I hope I don't write this book and 10 years from now they do something horrific that I'll be embarrassed by. Right. He's one of those kids I don't worry about. You don't worry about. Another impressive guy you wrote with Warwick Dunn. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you know, Warwick, um, for those who don't know much about his story, he's a running back in the NFL, 13 years, five foot eight, 178 pounds, tiny, tiny. Um, the smallest player to have ever achieved the 10,000-yard mark in the NFL as a rusher. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, that's not even the best part of his story. You know, he was a, um, growing up in Baton Rouge. His mother was a police officer. And uh, when he was three days past his 18th birthday, um, his mother was shot and killed in a robbery at a bank. And um, 
Wart raised his five younger brothers and sisters, went to college at Florida State, mm -hmm. uh, became a first round NFL draft pick, and turned around and immediately started buying homes for women like his mother, single mothers working multiple jobs um, to try to keep a roof over the heads of their children. Walter, or Wa uh, Warwick, who won the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award, um, Warwick uh, wanted those mothers to experience something his mother never did. Mm -hmm. And um, to finish his book, which we did um, a couple of years ago, to finish his book, uh, Warwick and I went to death row and uh, sat down with the man that killed his mom. And uh, at the end of an hour in a death row cell, uh, Warwick then looked at the man and forgave him. Really? Most amazing thing I've ever watched somebody do in my life. What did the what, what did the man do? What the he cried? I mean, you know, what, what could he do? I mean, yeah. you know, he was he knew uh, he knew what he'd done, but he also knew that um, uh, that Warwick done it just gave him the greatest gift he could ever get. Yeah. Wow. You know, we hear great stories about these guys, the Warwick Dunn's, the Walter Paytons. I think of Steve Young, who has a great reputation, the former San Francisco Forty mm -hmm. ers quarterback. Why does it the media, why does the mainstream media concentrate more on those guys and less on the Michael Vicks of the world and Roethlisberger doing his thing? You, you know what I'm saying, those types well, of things. Well, I think there's, you know, there's <clears throat> ample readership, viewership surveys out there for, uh, that, that suggest that, 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 that the public likes to see, <clears throat> uh, you know, everybody wants to worship a hero to a certain mm -hmm. place and then they want to kind of see him fall. Yeah. Then you kind of want to root for him to come back up again and, and put it back together. There's, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's an interesting cycle to um, hero worship in sports in America. Um, truth is that, uh, that I, I am not sure why they don't focus on those stories, but if they'll leave them for me to write a book every year, that, that, I'm, I'm good with that too. <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Right. Speaking of these guys, some of these guys, they, uh, so many of them, it seems to me like they just have the world handed to them. And I, I know they literally don't because you, you have to work very hard to get to that level. But when you get to that level, why do they take such huge, crazy risk to do things that can possibly just wipe it out in a split second? Well, um, there is, without question, a, a, a part of their mindset when you try to dissect the 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 mind of a champion, part of it is an invincibility. I mean, you have to believe that about yourself to truly get to that level. Um, you know, some people take that, I mean, Ben Roethlisberger riding a, you know, a, a motorcycle without a helmet and, right. you know, at, at, at a high, high rate of speed, not very smart. Right. But there's an awful lot of folks out there who would, uh, in the world of sports, who would tell you that that little tweak of invincibility is, is necessary to kind of be able to to, to achieve at the, at the highest level. You have to have a sense that, um, that you can survive anything. Right. And um, I, I tell you, you know, you look at the size of some of those guys that, that hit Ben Roethlisberger <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, you know, if you don't believe that you can get back up every time, uh, if you have a, a, a momentary fear, um, right. you, um, you probably don't do that job and you certainly don't play in the Super Bowl. Yeah. So. Well, it's like I've heard some of the race car drivers say, you know, they have no fear. I mean, they, they don't, I guess the attitude is it can't happen to me or it won't happen to me, right? If you, if you for a second think that it will, um, you, you've, you've taken, you lost the mental edge that yeah. will give you the opportunity to be successful. Speaking of somebody who had a real command of himself, Michael Jordan, tell the story about, you, you got to play a little basketball with Michael, right? Uh, Jordan does an event every year in Las Vegas. It's a charity event that he does for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And he brings a um, hundred old guys like me in who love basketball, right. uh, and they and, and we play over the course of four days. Divides us into teams of ten. Has great coaches: Mike Shashevsky from Duke, Roy Williams from North Carolina. I mean, these are great coaches who are coaching us over the course of those days. And um, uh, but during one of the days, Jordan actually walks through as we're stretching at seven in the morning and picks twenty guys out, and he goes and lets them go one on one with. Uh, let's you go one on one with Michael Jordan. Uh, the deal is it's a game to one, and he gets the ball first. So <laughs> it's really not much of a competition right. for most guys. <laughs> right. And uh, and so Jordan, actually, um, uh, when I got my turn, when my when my name was called to to be up there, uh, I decided rather than to go out and try to guard him really tight, which is what a lot of guys were doing, and he was you know moving right past him and dunking. I decided to step back and make him challenge him to take a jump shot, 
and uh, Jordan uh, took the shot, he missed, I got the rebound, and then I took it back outside. And as he was stepping up, um, there was some trash talk going on between the two of us. And, <laughs> Uh, I had told him when he took his shot. I told him I didn't think he had a chance. I didn't think <laughs> I didn't think he could make the shot. I didn't think he had it in him, which was a play on his Gatorade commercial. Is it in you? Right, right. And um, uh, and Jordan. So when I got the ball, he looks at me and he says, "I know you don't have that shot in you." And as he stepped up, I hit a 26 foot shot that <laughs> I will talk about for the rest of my life. It's one of those. Um, my wife actually got so tired of hearing me tell the story that. Um, she had bibs made, you know, we have bibs for the children that say, my daddy scored on Jordan, and <laughs> my daughter's bib says he really did, so it's great, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things where um, they hopefully we'll live on forever. Yeah. What was Jordan's attitude when uh, that happened? Jordan gave it to me. He, oh, uh, did he really? Yeah, he wanted to rematch. <laughs> I told him, dude, you had your shot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but he was special. I mean, boy, he was. I mean, he, he mentally he he was right with the game mechanically the whole nine yeah. yards, right? Yeah. I, and interesting though, he will tell you that his greatest strength was his mental. He, yeah. he you know, he said, "I always know I had a seven inch advantage over everybody I competed against." Yeah. And he pointed to his temples. He said, "You know that that the space between my ears was what gave me." the edge over everybody I competed against. Yeah. So. Speaking of great people in basketball, John Wooden, UCLA. Now you had an opportunity to write with him. Tell I me did. about him. I did. I, I, um, Coach Wooden was a mentor to me, actually. I began a process of, of more than almost 12 years ago now um, where I, I met Coach and as a result of a conversation, um, he agreed to allow me to come out and spend some time with him every other month. And I would fly out on a morning, spend an afternoon with him, work with him the next morning, and fly home. It was just, it, They were simple mentoring sessions. Mm -hmm. And his deal was, as long as I came well prepared, uh, he would invite me back. And so I would prepare questions, and um, I would look, and I would, I would try to understand characters and history that were important to him, try to learn from him on a consistent basis. What, what did people teach you? And, um, uh, and then if, about three years ago, I asked him the question of, you know, who were the key mentors of your life? Who, who made you who you were? And that concept of the mentors of this amazing man's life, a man who taught so many about leadership, uh, became the guts of a book that we did together called A Game Plan for Life. Interesting. The first half of the book is the seven mentors of his life, people who shaped him, back half are seven people whose lives he changed by mentoring them. Who and were some uh, of the people that shaped him? Really fascinating to me. I mean, obviously, his father and his and his his father and his and his high school and and college coaches was very simple, but interesting to me, he he, he called his wife one of his mentors, which okay. is interesting. You know, there are a lot of people who talk about their spouse as being right. integral to their success, but they don't often refer to him as a mentor. Right. But John Wooden talked about how she taught him so many lessons, uh, you know, about faith and about trust and about the things that you have to have if you're going to be the spouse of a high profile you know, athlete, coach, and, and John Wooden, most people don't know it, long before he was a coach, he was one of the best basketball players in America, three-time All-American at Purdue. Uh, he was the first person ever inducted in the Hall of Fame as both an athlete and a coach. Wow. Um, but, uh, so John Wooden, but then he talked about two mentors that surprised me, um, people he never met. And that was a real eye-opener for me. He talked about Abraham Lincoln and Mother Teresa. No kidding. And he said, you know, they lived such exceptional lives. They did such great things that, um, that they mentored me, even though I never had the chance to meet them because I read everything I could about them so that I could try to be like them. Yeah. And I thought, wow, what a great lesson. We always think of mentoring as going to an elementary school or a middle school and yeah. spending an hour in a library with a kid once a month. Yeah. The truth is mentoring is just living a good life. Yeah. He was, yeah. he was a he good was man. Yeah, he was literally, um, I have hundreds of hours with John Wooden tape and I would tell you that I never left there not feeling like I was a better man yeah. than I was when I got there. Of all the people you've met and worked with over the years, who is your, your favorite? Who, or, and let me, let me rephrase the question. Tough. Who did you meet that you were able to take away the most? for you to enrich your life, I guess, is my question. You know, it would probably be uh, Dale Brown, who was the coach at LSU when Shaquille O'Neal was there. Um, Dale, I loved his fight. I loved, you know, I loved his passion for life. I love, uh, Dale was just one of these amazing men who, uh, in every level, 
mm -hmm. uh, became someone I grew to respect and love. And, and when I got married, uh, he was the best man in my wedding. Oh, okay, he nice. yeah. just was someone that I, I, I am that passionate about. I, because it was a, it was a chance meeting, you know, I was a reporter and, and I, and I interview him and next thing you know, I realized there was just so much I could get from this man mm -hmm. that, uh, I, I, and, and, and hopefully some I could give. And we developed a relationship that I would, um, I would tell you was life changing for me. Yeah. Speaking of life changing, and, and, and I, I apologize for asking you this with such a short amount of time left, but you're a cancer survivor. Advice you might give to anyone else? Uh, you have to have hope. You have to, you know, I really do believe that uh, uh, hope is the greatest drug out there. Yeah. You know, it's greater than any, any medical treatment they can give you. If you, don't, if you don't believe that you can beat it, you're going to have a tough time beating it. And um, I, that's a lesson I learned from a lot of other cancer survivors since. Mm -hmm. uh, in the seven years, I'm cancer-free now. It's awesome. But uh, I, I had a chance to interview and spend time with a lot of other cancer survivors. And, and they will tell you that, that um, those who have hope, uh, have a leg up on everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Your 16 characteristics to greatness. Um, yes. Give me, give me three or four of, of the most important ones. Um, the value of association. You're only as good as the people that you choose to put in your inner circle. The truth is, um, John Wooden used to say it all the time. You will never outperform your inner circle. Mm -hmm. If you want to know what you can be, and this is especially valuable for high school, college kids. You want to know what you have the capacity to be. Look at the people you put around you. Um, and the idea of, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that it's a lot about the idea of willingness to be a role model yeah. um, and how you handle adversity. Those would be three that I would tell you are, uh, are integral to anybody's true success. How you handle adversity is an absolute, it's promise to all of us. Some, some level of adversity is what you do with it yeah. um, shapes who you are. Yeah. Don Yeager, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you so I much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. DonYeager.com. You can uh, check out some of his many books, his many articles, and I uh, think you'll take a lot away. Interesting personalities that uh, Don has talked to uh, over the years. I think you'll uh, think you'll enjoy surfing around the website there. Speaking of surfing around in the social media world, well, you can find us. We're on Facebook. All you have to do is search out Conversations with Jeff Weeks. Certainly love to hear from you. I really do appreciate you spending some time with us. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. I'm Jeff Weeks. Take good care of yourself, and we'll see you soon. Support for this program is provided in part by these corporate sponsors. And by viewers like you. I'm Jeff Weeks and I love to talk, but I find I learn a lot more when I listen. I hope you'll listen in on the next Conversations as we talk with engaging personalities from all walks of life. It's real conversation that matters. Conversations with Jeff Weeks, now Thursday at 7.30 and Friday at 9.